Uh oh, religion and politics? On YouTube? Oh, it's for history and world building? We should obviously be fine then. You're already taking time to watch this video, so use a second to go down there and subscribe. If not, you're missing out on a bunch of great world building content. It's free, and you can always unsubscribe. And check the description for the world building Discord, Patreon, and Minecraft server. The Stoneworks community is a lot of fun. Religion and politics go hand in hand. Actually, they're doing a lot more than holding hands. Oh god, my monetization. Yeah, so the wall between church and state is less a wall and more of an old condom. Uh, in many historical societies. So when world building anything that has to do with politics or religion, you'll probably want to bring the other up. Religions will often focus on the political issues of the time and focus on how their religious virtues can solve the problems. Political people will often appeal to religious values, traditions, or differences to justify what they want to do. I imagine we'll see a lot of both in the comments section. So put on your air helmets, friends. We are now descending into the great salty sea vagina that is YouTube politics and religion. Here's my disclaimer for religion videos. And here's a separate disclaimer for this video. When world building the interaction between religion and politics, it really comes down to a few things gaining legitimacy from spiritual and moral authorities, justifying stuff that you want to do as leader, acting on cultural differences that are manifested in religion, and playing out church politics. Did you guys know that monasteries would often beef with each other? I love that! Bald guy fight! I want to start with some territory that might be historically familiar, but not well explored in this context. The spread of Christianity to the Anglo-Saxons. After the Romans pulled out of Britain in 420, blaze it, the British population was already fairly Christianized, but then a bunch of pagan Germanic tribesmen came in and took over the eastern side of the island. They worshipped gods that were similar to the Norse ones, Woden and Thunor. But as tends to happen when surrounded by Christians like the Celtic Britons, the Picts, and the Franks, the Germanic settlers were soon the target of Catholic missionaries. Now, for a society whose power was gained through war and conquest, it would be weird to worship a turn-the-other-cheek meek dying on the cross kind of god, especially since you don't just add him to your pantheon like they usually did, you would have to throw out all your ancestors' gods. However, converting from the Germanic pantheon to Christianity would make allies with the Catholic Church and any other Christian states, like the powerful Merovingian dynasty in France. It would also give the converts access to the papal bureaucracy, which brought with it many benefits at the expense of giving up some influence to the Pope. One of the most profound benefits here was that of literacy. This allowed for the teaching of skills, personal property records, and higher education. What we see in the religious political dealings of the Anglo-Saxons is that religion really takes a backseat to people's political goals. The first big conversion of the Old English was Athelbert in the southeastern kingdom of Kent. He married a Christian Merovingian princess named Bertha, and one of the marriage conditions was that he allow Catholic missionaries to set up shop in his lands. Eventually, Athelbert personally converted. Then there's Edwin of Northumbria, who mandated that his entire kingdom convert. This was a risky move, since it was possible that Edwin's nobles and thanes would look at this new religion, then back at their old gods which had given them wealth, power, status, and been like, nah, Edwin, you're out. But the Christianization worked out fine in the end, until Edwin got killed in a battle by a coalition of Christians from Wales and pagans from Mercia. See, religion isn't the biggest deal when you're worried about who controls what. While adopting Christianity would generally align you with the other Christian powers, it's more of a secondary alignment. The early Middle Ages was a time of great political flux among the seven English kingdoms, as hegemonic power and religious alliances would shift around rapidly. At one point, there was even a split co-rule of the Kingdom of East Anglia. One side was pagan, and the other side Christian, though the Christian king eventually stepped down to become a monk. But as we all know, Christianity sunk its roots into England and beat out paganism. And a thousand years later, Europe used spreading Jesus as a moral justification to brutalize the rest of the world. 
Funny thing about that colonization, in North America, a lot of early colonists were religious and ideological minorities from Britain. Presbyterians, Quakers, Puritans, Protestants from England with their own non-monarchy oriented churches. The Crown didn't like this very much, and these Protestants had to jump ship for the New World. Now settled in America and having a whole Atlantic Ocean of breathing room from the monarchy-run Anglican Church, these Protestant ideologies grew uniquely, and America saw a wave of religious revival in the 1740s called the Great Awakening. By the way, when researching this, I found this American history textbook, which is super funny, succinct, and thorough. Not an advertisement, just trying to help the A-Push students out there. I'll put it in the description. The Great Awakening was part of a cultural shift away from British domination. In America, it weakened the British elite's control of the media and the alignment of the monarchy with the people's spiritual authority. People were now encouraged to find a personal relationship with God, so many would come to question and leave their more hierarchical churches. Kind of sounds like the revolution. The Great Awakening definitely was not the defining factor of this war, but it distanced people from British authority and furthered the cultural divide. This probably made going to war over tea seem a little more justified. We've got this idea of separation of church and state, which is debatable to how much these things can actually be separated. But what happens when politics and religion are so tightly wrapped around each other that they're indistinguishable? In classical Rome, religion worked a little something like this. Make the gods happy, and they'll do good things for you. So you'd want to keep them happy, and you'd want the most powerful people, the real shakers of society, to be involved in this. The select group of noble families, the patricians, were simultaneously politicians, generals, and priests. Oh, and incredibly rich. How could I forget? Take Pontifex Maximus, for example. That's not a guy, that's the job title. Are you not entertained? He was the leader of the head priests in Rome, and actually, the Pontifex Maximus still is. It was an elected position from the patrician class, although eventually the plebs earned the right to run for it. These high priests were tasked to maintain peace with the gods. Yeah, so we want a new golden statue of a cow. You'll need to give Jupiter the old razzle-dazzle happy ending to make it happen. Jupiter Optimus Maximus. The head priests kept track of omens, the calendar, rituals, and funerals. They would also oversee the people responsible for divination, which would happen by trying to read an animal's entrails or by bird watching. Great science, guys! The Pontifex Maximus had certain powers, like being able to legislate public morality and being the final interpreter of the law books. You know, Supreme Court stuff, like a dictator. No wonder Augustus eventually fused this position with his title of princeps. Jumping forward a few hundred years from that, have you heard of this emperor named Diocletian? He transformed the model of imperial rule from the Roman principate that Augustus started to the Roman dominant. But oddly enough, Diocletian was a sub. A part of the shift to the Roman dominant was a rebranding of the emperor's image. No longer was he just the first citizen of Rome. He was now divinely ordained, backed by Jupiter himself. Many emperors before him were assassinated by the Imperial Guard. Rest in peace, my homeboy Aurelian. But would you want to kill someone who's backed by the gods and risk invoking their ire upon you? No, probably not. Especially if they're leading you into big battles for the entirety of the Empire. Diocletian, who won many such battles, also started wearing golden crowns and purple robes. And do you see where this is going? The medieval concept of ruling by divine right? Eh? I get to rule because God chose me? 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 I'd also like to mention that Diocletian's reign started at the closing years of what's called the third century crisis. Now gamers, epic world building tip. When there's a big crisis, people start looking around and saying, hey, this shit is not working out very well, now is it? And they'll start doing things in different ways, including politics and religion. 
otherwise the existing structure falls apart and other ones take its place. So crises will bring about change. The Romans' religious philosophy as a whole was also beneficial for them politically. Before Christianity rolled around, Roman religion was very open-ended about which gods were real. See, like, all of them to a certain extent? The Romans believed foreign gods had a real power too, especially in their native lands. But the people in Rome did have their own native religion. Mom, can we get Greek gods? We have Greek gods at home. Greek gods at home. Roman gods! Yeah, sure, that's fair. The Roman gods and mythology were hugely shaped by Greek culture because there were a bunch of big, cool Greek city-states to their south that the little town of Rome looked up to. But in the end, this helped them. Adopting gods and having this polytheistic fluidity of religion allowed them to be culturally chill with a lot of the people that they conquered. Religiously, I'm sure the conquered people didn't like them that much. Plus, the Mediterranean and Europe had been exchanging religious and cultural ideas for thousands of years, so they could just say, Oh, you call Mars by the name of Linus? How interesting that you can use our name for him too! Although the Celtic god Linus was considered a god of healing, so either I misjudged you Mars, or the comparisons can be pretty tenuous. There was another kind of ideology where the Romans believed that their gods were the true gods, but every other god out there was just a version of those gods with a different name. However, none of these systems really worked out in Judea, as the native population there believed that there's only one god, and it's their god. So you get some cultural friction, especially when one of your shittiest Roman emperors mandates that there should be a statue of himself in every single temple. In most provinces, that's fine. The statue didn't need to be revered anyways, it's just homage to the emperor's power. It's like having a picture of your grandma up in your house. And who's gonna believe that Nero or Caligula are actual gods? But the old Hebrew book makes it pretty damn clear that their almighty supreme deity would absolutely be uncomfortable with this new arrangement. This, along with the fact that the Romans treated Judea especially poorly, led to some Jewish riots, revolts, and now their temple is on fire. Can I get an F in the chat, please? That's the Hebrew F. Feh. After one such revolt, the Romans expelled the Jewish population from Jerusalem, which paved the way for the large Jewish diaspora in Europe. And that is where I will end the political discussion involving the Jewish race. Let's lighten the mood a little bit and make our way to the Middle East. When people say, Oh, they've always been fighting about religion over there for thousands of years. No, dummy. You're so dense you thought it was a window closing on a tabby cat's tail last night and not me popping a surprise visit to your mom's waterbed. <coughs> what I'm trying to say is, the Ottoman Empire, dude. The Ottomans rose to power during the decline of the Muslim Caliphates and the Byzantine Empire. And religion was a core part of the Ottoman political strategy. They used it for maintaining order and dynastic legitimacy. The Ottomans were a Turkish group from modern Turkey, and at its peak it stretched all the way from Algeria to the Balkans, around the Black Sea, and down the sea coasts of the Arabian Peninsula. Huge! Bigger than the Roman Empire. So religiously, this territory was super diverse, but it was dominantly Muslim, Christian, and Jewish. Make no mistake though, the state religion was Sunni Islam. The ruling Ottoman family's legitimacy rested on its ability to uphold Sharia law for the empire's giant Muslim population. And it did, mostly by having an educated class of Islamic legal scholars called Qadis. The highest of these judges, the Sheikh al-Islam, held a very powerful office, as he had the final word when it came to official religious interpretations, and therefore Ottoman law. Since the Sultan's legitimacy largely came from upholding Islamic law and tradition, he would not want to be caught disagreeing with the Sheikh al-Islam. But sometimes they clashed, and whatever the issue was, it could go either way. The Sultan had the ultimate authority, but the Sheikh al-Islam's disagreement would cause public outcry. It's worth noting that Orthodox Christians, Armenian Christians, and Jews also had their own bureaucratic hierarchies to uphold their own religious laws, giving them a degree of representation and autonomy. 
But the leaders of the Christian and Jewish hierarchies were subservient to the Sheikh al-Islam, and Muslim law was prioritized over the others. But this system helped to let everyone do their own thing, all while centralizing the law under the broad umbrella of Ottoman government. Maintaining minority religions while keeping legitimacy and upholding Islamic law? That's good for dynastic stability. There are people around today that can directly link their lineage to the first Ottoman Sultan in 1300. That is a lot of men. I had a dream about that recently. It was also very important that the Ottomans be seen as the rightful successors to the various caliphates that came before them. Again, the Ottomans were not Arab, and to be titled as a successor leader of the Islamic world, a caliph, you would have had to be a descendant from the original Arab tribe of Muhammad, the Quraysh. Their workaround for this was kind of clever. See, Islam originally had an explosive expansion. I had to, I had to. Which was led by the caliphs, hence the Rashidun, Umayyad, and Abbasid caliphates. The caliphs, no, the caliphs, were the political and religious successors to Muhammad's first expansion. This basically non-existent distinction between political and religious leadership ensured that the entire Muslim community would be loyal to the caliph. Now, who gets to be the legitimate caliph? That's how you get wars and revolutions in different sects of Islam. Anyways, these caliphates together had political power centers in three main cities, Cairo, Damascus, and Baghdad. In the 1500s, the Ottomans captured these power centers, along with Mecca and Medina, and the last living caliph of the Abbasid dynasty. This made the Ottomans the de facto leaders of the Islamic world. Nobody could challenge them on this claim to succession so they could brand themselves as the defenders of Sunni Islam. Being the de facto leaders, the Sultan took the title of Caliph, of necessity, which I think is fucking hilarious. Regardless, that's a lot of layers of legitimacy. Especially since all around the Middle East, Islam had grown very decentralized and very diverse since the times of Muhammad. Frankly, I'm surprised you've stuck around for this long. Kudos for not having your attention spans destroyed by TikTok. Hi. Islam and Christianity have many institutional sects which decide the doctrines and practices of the religion. In Islam, there are many Sufi brotherhoods which guide people in Quranic spiritualism. It's kind of like yoga and meditation as is to Hinduism. And certain sects of Shia Islam have an imam which heads their entire denomination. They choose the stance that they take on the current issues, and they choose how to deal with new problems that arise within the Islamic communities. In Christianity, you have the patriarch daddies of Rome, Constantinople, Armenia, and Ethiopia, all governing their own sects. When it comes to the internal politics of a religious institution, it all comes down to who the people respect and listen to as authorities on the divine and the spiritual. Individuals can gain respect and power in their own religious institutions through intellectual exploration of the theology and philosophy, having powerful political friends that install them as overseeing clergymen, being born into the priestly class, or simply being on the right side of doctrinal debates. It obviously depends on the religion and the culture that you're talking about though. Like in today's Catholic priesthood, being born into the priestly class isn't going to be a huge way to gain power, because priests aren't allowed to bone. Quickly returning to Britain, the Irish Church and the Roman Catholic Church struggled for influence over England. A lot of the intellectual debate surrounding this had to do with when to celebrate Easter and how to properly worship. The Irish Church was much more spiritual, while the Roman Catholic Church was more organized and hierarchical. Eventually, the most powerful king of England, Oswy of Northumbria, sided with the Roman Catholics. This led to some Roman Catholic clergymen supplanting the northern seats of power previously held by Irish Celtic clergymen. So Roman Catholics won, Irish Church, I mean, are they a thing anymore? While world building your histories about politics and religion, remember that political leaders often act as third party judges in religious debates just to get them to shut up about their tiny differences. 
Who cares if Jesus is a man or a spirit or a god or whatever? I mean, I guess it does matter when you're concerned about like your soul going to heaven or hell or something. Oh shit, no, now I'm doing it. And I know, I know, I keep talking about England, but I've recently been listening to the British History Podcast and I fucking love it. Seriously, go support Jamie instead of me. <laughs> As you can see, any institution is greatly affected by what the people believe and who they think should be in charge. Looking at my script, I think it's best to cut the discussion on Confucianism into a part 2, which can be found here! After that, there will be a video on religious wars! Fun! If this comment section won't rally you up, then that one surely will! But in that one, we'll talk about the Crusades, the Balkans, the Skyrim Civil War, the Aztecs, and more, so come check it out, it's a good time. But that's all for now, so leave a dislike, an angry comment, and get out of my house.